So remember, anything you say or type will be preserved for all of posterity. Um, while we're waiting to see if anyone else joins, there's just a few housekeeping things. Um, last week, someone had asked if they could see um, people's questions. And GoToWebinar if, won't let other participants see the questions if you use the question box. Um, but there is a chat box. And if you type your questions in there and then make sure you're set to um, that you send it to all audience, the entire audience, then everyone will be able to see your questions and um, your comments. And um, so if you would if you wouldn't mind doing that, I think that would be helpful for everyone. And then that way, if there's a question that um I maybe don't quite have an answer on. Um, someone else can chime in without me having to completely repeat the question. <laughs> but if you do want to use that question box, that's okay. That's fine with me. Um, whatever you're comfortable with. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so before we get started um, with the, the mark 2XX fields, uh, we did have an assignment, kind of a survey of um, your familiarity with Mark and your um, whether you can um, customize those fields, what you can customize in your um, ILS. And so for the most part, and I'll just pull that up here, I do have the answers posted. And so for the most part, um, everyone is pulling their records from their vendor and or OCLC. Um, and, you know, some of you are creating your mark records from scratch when you don't have the right record for the item in hand. And it seems to be kind of for those non book items. And then um, we had a wide variety of <laughs> automated systems. And um, you know, most of you are aware that you can do some, you can edit in the fixed fields, uh, and a few were, weren't sure. And I encourage those of you who, oh, hey, I got a question here. We can't see the chat box. How do I pull it up? Hmm. That's a really good question. And I don't know. Um, Let's see. Um, let's view. Oh, click on the red arrow at the top. Is that what um, people should do to go ahead and see the chat box? Or, oh, okay. Yeah, because you can, there's a red arrow. And you guys probably can't see this. Let me show my other screen. Um, Okay, so right up here, there's a red arrow, and right now I have it clicked so I can see this entire panel right here, but if you, um, so if it's closed, you can click to open it. No, it's just the question box and not a chat box with everyone box. Hmm. Okay, well, I will have to look into this a little bit more for now. Let's just do... Um, we'll just do questions, and I will go ahead and transcribe those questions and um, any comments that people have, and I'll dig through this a little bit more. <laughs> if someone else has an idea, um, go ahead and type it in the question, and I can I can um, relay that to uh, the rest of the class. So I will continue working on that. I promise. One of these weeks, I'll get the hang of this. Um, Okay, let me go back to, let's see, screen, there we go. And where was I? Oh yes, editing your fixed fields. And uh, you know, for the most part, it looks like people are editing their fixed fields and trying to verify um, the data and correct if necessary. And if you're not doing this, I would encourage you to do this to at least with um, 
maybe your non-book items, at least go through and just make sure you've got the right format and the right um, the right format and making sure that things, you know, so the proper icons will show up um, or if you do have that ability for your patrons. And I think it does help with the searching as well. If, you know, at least the right format and um, bibliographic level, if it's a serial or a monograph, I think that does help a lot. And then we're on to the automated system, which I, you know, allowing customization, which I also looked into that a little bit. And from what I can tell, it looks like with most vendors, it's just a matter of asking your vendor what you can do or what you can't do. And um, it looks like a lot of you are aware that your systems um, have that capability. And whether it's you or your library director or somebody else who is um, dealing with that, um, so, and I can certainly understand why people, um, maybe are choosing not to focus on that so much, uh, when it comes down to, you know, priorities and you have a really heavy workload and there's a lot going on. For me, that, that's always kind of not at the top of my priority list. So that's it. Unless there's any more questions about the last assignment, we can move on um to the two xx fields so it doesn't look like there are any questions about the assignment where there are there any questions about the two xx fields and um the reading So I'm getting radio silence. I'm just going to assume that there weren't any questions <laughs> or at least um, none right now. So we'll just go through and um, kind of review this reading a little bit. And so uh, there's a lot. There's many more 2XX fields than the ones that I um, kind of highlighted in the reading. There's, um, I chose to, to pick out the ones that you'll probably come across the most in your copy cataloging. Um, the main one being that 245 field, which is where you put your title and um, whoever is responsible for the creation of the item. And um, you can see that I have various examples here of what the 245 can look like. And let's see if I got into the 246 feel, because the 245 can be kind of tricky at times. It, it's not always easy to tell what exactly the title is, especially when you're working with um, you know, a lot of state publications. Um, and so let's see, let me go through here. We do, I do get to the 246. Yeah, the 246, which is, it, the 246 is a really great field because it gives you that option of alternate titles. So in this case that you're seeing on the screen right now, 20 ways to draw and doodle, um, you know, your main title would be 20, just two O, and then you would spell out 20 and that gives your patrons a lot more options. Uh, I use it a lot when I'm working on records because I do a lot with um, state publications and and if you've ever worked with state publications, you know, their titles aren't always obvious or there's a lot of different options for what your title could be. And let me... Um, pull up something here. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Um, and you can't see where 246 is on this record, but you could see where there's maybe a possibility of doing a 246. Um, if you wanted to do um, 
just state of Nebraska statutes, rules, and regulations relating to optometry without that 1989 in the front, or if you wanted to do rules and regulations relating to optometry. Uh, the 246, for me, I think of it as what else might my patrons search by? Um, or I used to do research for a living, and what else, and I was sometimes handed like really odd citations, and you know, that might have part of a title or a really, really long title, and so I would quite often um, get stuck, get lost, get confused what, what what I was supposed to search for, and so as a cataloger, I if I see those kind of added titles or those alternate titles, um, all that information. I try to make multiple 246s, so all of that information there. So someone who who has kind of a weird citation can, um, excuse me, can um, can find it. You know, hopefully, regardless of what information they've been handed or whether they can. Um, let's see. Here's another example of one that could be a, um, you could have a 246 where in the title you've got Agriculture and Food Act of 1981. You could do a 246 for a summary of the major provisions with comments and interpretation. Again, it's just, it's another way that um, your patrons can search for things and you can do unlimited 246s. Um, and the other big, we do have the 250, which is the addition statement. And those come in handy when people are searching for a specific addition, you know, if they want a revised edition or um, they're looking for a title that was published by a specific publisher. But I think um, probably when, when RDA was introduced, it, it, it affected all aspects of MARC but it really affected the 264 or the 260. It used to be the 260. And then when RDA was introduced, um, it became the 264, the publication. And before you would just um, type in, you know, the publisher, or if you didn't know the publisher, you'd do those Latin abbreviations. And now you're given a lot more options in terms of, um, how to express that information if for example there isn't a publisher you you know you can drop down to like the the, the um the manufacturer or the distributor but we're not you that's something you really don't need to focus on most things that you handle will have a publisher and you guys are awfully quiet today so i'm going to assume there's no questions And a lot of this information you can find if you have questions about how the 264 should look, you can go to, I showed you this website last week, um, OCLC Bibliographic Formats and Standards. And if you just click on the two XX fields and you can see over here, um, I think this is one of the things I, I like about this is I can see over here off to the side, um, all of the different fields that are in the 2XX. And so if I'm not exactly sure about what kind of field, what field I should use, I know there's a field there, um, you know, I'll come in and kind of look and just scan down and see what my options are and if there's something that fits. And, um, and then down here at the bottom, there's the 264. And again, there's just lots of examples of how to record this information and there's you have a lot of different options and again um, we just we did away with the if you're familiar with AACR2 you had the Latin abbreviations of SI and SL um, publisher unknown um, publisher location unknown um, we we did away with those and just put it in their place. P place of, excuse me, place of publication not identified and publisher not identified. And um, 
you will probably see in older records where they abbreviated the publisher and in the newer RDA records, uh, they are asking that we spell out the publisher. And if there's multiple divisions that we include those divisions as well, that that's optional. Uh, in my opinion, you know, if you just want to do just the main publisher, like in this case, Blue Sky, excuse me, Blue Sky Press, you can do just Blue Sky Press and you don't you don't need to do an imprint of Scholastic. Um, and probably with the 264, one of the other big changes uh, has to do with that publication date. And in AACR2, you know, we kind of just allowed for any date that seemed to be um, affiliated with the item. Um, you know, we'd try and do the C for the copyright if it was if it had that copyright date. And with 264 and those changes, it it is um, if you have a copyright date, you do put it in brackets. We don't we don't make that assumption anymore that the copyright and the publication date are one and the same. But if it is, if you do have um, a publication date, then you can go ahead and just you don't need any brackets. And so the way you know that it's a publication date is, um, well, you don't see that little copyright if it's, it's usually on that title page there. And so um, I've gone through and kind of reviewed the reading and kind of hit the high points. Um, not seeing any questions. We can go ahead and start talking about the assignment um, that will be due next Wednesday. And I'll just pull that up here so we can all see that. And so for this assignment, uh, you'll see that there are slides. Uh, let me go back. That there are slides here, and they've all been numbered. And you can use the information provided on those slides to go ahead and do your assignment. Oh, hey, I've got some questions here. So Mary Austin, if you have both a publication date and a copyright date, do you include both? That's a really good question, Mary. And, you know, it kind of depends if you have, for example, if they're different, I would definitely include both then. Um, do the publication date. Let's get out of here. Um, do, and I'm on the OCLC page right now. Um, so we'll just kind of use this at the bottom. For example, um, if, for example, like it was published, something was published in 2010, but it was actually copyrighted in 2002, you would want to go ahead and use those those two dates. If, for example, um, they're the same, then that's optional. If you just want to do um, a 2010 in that subfield C, you don't need to do um, then a 264 with an indicator of four. Um, but you can, um, personally, um, I sometimes do, um, and, and that's just kind of, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. Do you have to do 264 fields to get both dates? Yes, you do have to do 264 fields to get both dates. Um, you would do a 264 um, with an indicator of one, and then you would do a 264 with an indicator of four. And you don't need to go and type out the whole um, publication statement here, those A and B subfields, if you can just do the, that subfield C. And is that clear? And 
then, oh, what about brackets? Um, oh, so do you mean if, for example, someone is using um, the, um, like the publication date, or excuse me, the copyright date up here in the subfield C, then yes, you would use brackets there because um, as it's stated in RDA, that is for the publication date. And so because we're using the copyright date, which is not always the same as the publication date, we would put it in brackets. And it would be the same thing if, for example, um, your item in hand doesn't have the, um, it doesn't list the place, place of publication or it doesn't list the publisher, as you can see here, you would do, you would put both of those in brackets because that's information that's not on the item. And um, with AACR2, if the information didn't come from the official source, you put it in brackets. And with RDA, if it doesn't come from the item itself, um, then you put it in brackets. And I'm sure, um, I hope I just didn't confuse everyone there with that. Um, okay, my second example shows the second 264 with the four indicator with a date not in brackets, but with a C. Okay, let me go back and take a look at that. Let's see here. Um, first example. I meant the OC exam. Oh, okay. Dot your handout. Okay. Thank you for clarifying, Mary. Um, so, would that be this example here, the Waverly, um, Iowa, distributed by CQ Products? Um, and they bracketed, I'm assuming because they bracketed that 2010 without the item in hand, um, I'm assuming that that's information that came from maybe outside the item or they're guessing at it. Um, or it is in fact the copyright, the two right below that, okay. Oh, these, these, the 2002 and the 1983. Um, so because there's no brackets, I'm assuming that the, that's actually on the item itself. It's kind of, it's hard to tell sometimes from these examples, uh, exactly what they mean. So sometimes you're kind of, you're kind of guessing and I'm probably not choosing the best examples here to show you. Generally, when something is bracketed and in mark, it means that it came um, from outside the item. For example, you did an internet search and you found um, when something was published, or you're kind of you're guessing at it. You're just you're not really sure. And did I answer your question, Mary? I'm not sure, still confused. Okay, um, let me see if I can figure out, let me go back to actually my examples here. Let's see if I have a full one here. Okay, so on this example, um, 
we have this subfield C, the 2000 is in brackets. And that's because as you can see from the item in hand that it's a copyright date. And the way the instructions are worded in RDA, um, it clearly calls for a publication date. And so when you put it in brackets, that date, you're saying that that's the copyright date. And we're just, we're assuming it is the same as the publication date. And then because in this example, because there is a publication date, we did not put that in in brackets here in this example. And um, you can also go ahead and add that 264 with, a, with the indicator of four, and you can go ahead and note that there is a copyright date as well, that they are one and the same. Is that better? or worse. I kind of feel like now I'm at the eye doctor where they say, is this one clear? Or is this one clear? And you're usually like, huh? No, they're both the same. I don't, you know. Um, and you can see here on the examples where um, the title page does list that 2011 and then on the back, it's got the copyright date. And um, hopefully that helped and hopefully, oh, okay. So if your item has a publication date of 2001 and a copyright date of 2000, would the second 264 field show brackets or just a C? Your second 264 would just do a C. You wouldn't need to do brackets. And that was from Mary Austin. Yes, that's, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily need to do um, you wouldn't need to do brackets for the second 264 because it's at, it's on the item itself. And this is from the other Mary. In the example before, we do not need to use a C with the 2000, even though it is a copyright date. That is correct. That would be. This example, yep, that is correct. Uh, the fact that it's in brackets is telling us that that is the copyright date. Now, if you didn't know a copyright date or a publication date and you were having to guess, you, you could do like 2000 with a question mark and that would tell us that we're kind of make, not really making it up, but we're guessing. And then, okay. Um, Let's see. There was another question. Alyssa, would the publication date always be listed on the title page or could it be somewhere else too? That is correct, Alyssa. That title page, it's not always there. Sometimes you'll find it on the back side of the title page. I think that's called the verso. And sometimes, depending on the book, like some publishers like National Geographic will stick their publication information at the end of the book. I don't know why they do this. And so it's okay, as long as it's coming from that item, you don't need to use brackets. Oh, and it looks like Mary Austin has figured things out. That's great, I'm really glad to hear that. And um, the other Mary and Alyssa, did I answer your questions? Or do I need to um, go into it a little bit? Okay, Mary, I did, thank you. Yes, thank you, good. I'm so glad to hear that I've answered your questions. Makes me happy. And so now that we've kind of cleared up the, the, the confusion that lies around copyright dates and publication dates, uh, would the publication, oh, nope, that is Alyssa's previous question. Okay, I see things out of the corner of my eye and I think there's a new question and I don't fully read it before I start talking. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. 
Uh, you know, yeah, publication dates, it, it can be kind of confusing. What is the publication date? What is the copyright date? And, you know, that's where I think looking at examples really does help a lot. And it's kind of just, yeah, it's just looking at examples. And, um, you know, the more items you handle, it seems like, um, you know, the more variety you see, the clearer it gets. And so if there aren't any more questions, um, I can go back and talk about the upcoming assignment. Where did I put that? Oh, I know where that is. OK. So uh, back to the upcoming assignment. Uh, again, you'll use those slides and you'll just go through and um, write out what you think the 245 or will look like for these. And, you know, you, you don't, oh, on this week's assignment, are you numbering the titles by the page numbers on the slide or is there a place where you have them numbered that I'm not seeing? Some of the titles take up more than one slide. That is a good question, Rochelle. And that is one reason why I like to talk about the assignments to make sure we're all sure what's going on here. Let's go ahead and look at the slides. I'll just pull them up. And... And let's see, okay, on this one, there's a one, so that would be your first example. Um, and so I think each page is numbered. Yeah, it looks like each page is numbered. And so it's gonna be the page number that corresponds with like the title page or the cover of the book. But if you do go ahead, or the CD, but if you do go ahead and like do a different one, that's that's okay. Um, I'm more concerned with that you know how, where to pull that information for the 246, or the 245, excuse me, and how it should look in the record. Does that make sense? Okay, good, glad to hear that. And we'll actually use, oh, good. I'm glad that helped you, Arlene, as well. And you'll notice that we will use the same examples um, throughout for all the homework. And I've gone ahead and posted them each week. And we have quite a few here and a variety of examples. And let me and we'll also I'll also ask you to complete um, a two fifty field for the slides if necessary. Um, and then that that wonderful two sixty four for some of these as well. And you'll get a chance to, to figure out brackets and copyright and publication dates and how that all works together. So if there aren't any questions, um, I did go ahead and post another resource here uh, on the page. And that is the cataloging resources available here at the Library Commission. And you can get these through interlibrary loan if you don't have them at your library. Um, and if you don't do interlibrary loan, you can contact our interlibrary loan um, librarian, Linda, and she can help you with that process. And I'm in the process of ordering some new books and updating this page. And let's see, where is, there's one in particular that I use a lot. And here we go. It's Mark 21 for Everyone, A Practical Guide by Deborah Fritz and her husband Richard. And even though it's, um, it's old, it's older, it was published in 2003, uh, and it doesn't talk about RDA at all, it's still a really great resource. And... I still refer to it. Um, Deborah Fritz um, 
she really lays it out in a very um, easy to understand way. And, um, you know, we really can see those patterns that I talked about last week. And it's I, I refer to it a lot still. I, I refer to it when I was putting the, together the materials for this class. And occasionally if I'm confused and something's not making sense, I, I still go back and look at that. Um, so I wanted to highlight that. And if and you'll see down here that some of the same resources that I have uh, on our class website, uh, those Web, those resources are here as well. I don't have the OCLC uh, link. Uh, I am going to go ahead and add that uh, just because I like that resource better than I think it's easier to follow than the Library of Congress stuff. But you can see we have um, Understanding Mark. If you really want to get into Mark, if you really just decide you love Mark and you want to learn more about Mark, you can really dig into it here. It's got a lot of um, a lot of information here about Mark. And let's see. And then this is the link I do have on our class website. So even when this class isn't active anymore, you'll still be able to get to these resources if you have questions while you're cataloging. So if there aren't any additional questions, I think I might be letting you guys go a little early this week. Wow, half an hour early. I, mean, I can ramble on for like another half hour, but um, your time is valuable and I, I don't want to waste it. So... Um, are there any, last call, any questions about anything in Mark, any weird records you've been seeing, um, anything unusual you're cataloging, or any questions about the assignments or the materials? Oh, I do have another question here. See, I knew if I just rambled long enough, someone would take pity on me. Um, this is from Mary Austin. Many of our audiobooks were cataloged before I came, and someone used a book template instead of an audiobook template, so I'm doing a lot of editing. Good. I'm glad to hear that, Mary. Uh, it is important um, because, um, as you guys have know, that the information contained on a book record isn't necessarily going to be the same information that you that will be in for an audiobook record. And you know, personally, I, I like to make sure that I've cataloged for the item in hand and that the record matches what we have in the collection. I think uh, to not do otherwise is probably um, I don't think it's really fair to our patrons. I think our our jobs is is are to do what we can to make it easy for patrons to find information or find the resources they want. And it may be they're not using the catalog, but we are. And so it should be it should be easy at least or easier for our colleagues. And catalog cleanup and someone mentioned this in the the survey that they're they're having to do some cleanup that when they switched vendors, they found some kind of bad records. And that's that's something that will always be ongoing, as as you probably know. Uh, when you think you're done, you find a record that uh, doesn't match what you have in hand. You know, someone pulled in whatever because it was the only record there, and it's it's frustrating to have to go in and clean those up. But that's just kind of the way it is. And I usually, you know, personally at my last job, uh, I knew the person who had been the cataloger before me. And there were times where I just kind of wanted to wring her neck and be like, what were you thinking? But um, I guess the argument could also be made that it's better to have a record than no record at all. So. 
So I'm going to assume that it's clear as mud. Oh, okay, Lori Leonard, thank you. Yes, we experience a lot of cleanup using a consortium catalog that others, yes. Um, that people attach um, large print books and paperback and hardback when they really, like a, a large print in particular should get its own record because it is a different format. Uh, and quite often I think that pa pagination, pagination is a little different. And depending on your consortium rules, uh, and some consortiums, you know, they can you can put paperback and hardback on the same record. You know, if the information is all the same, page numbers, publisher, um, you know, if they have all the same features, you you can you can put that all on the same record if you want. And but yeah, it's and again, I understand why people do that. It's you're in a hurry, or you don't see another record, or you know, you just you want to get the item into circulation, and so close enough is good enough. Oh, okay. And Alyssa has another question. The records we get from Follett are in AACR too. Do you recommend changing all of that? You know. That, that's a really good question. And that, um, that's up to you. If they're good records, you can leave them as they are. If you want to go ahead and update them and change the 260 to a 264 and add in the 3, 3X fields, which we'll get into next week, and get rid of your abbreviations and spell things out. That's that's entirely up to you. It kind of depends on your workflow and um, you know what your workload is and your audience. Uh, do most of our patrons notice the difference? Probably not. But I know here at the Library Commission, as I've come across um, those kind of records, I have been trying to update them as I go. And we are going to continue seeing AACR2 records, um, just as we see AACR records and records from the time before that. I don't know what that was called, but. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm glad that answered your question, Alyssa. Uh, you know, our catalogs will always be a mishmash of records. And so it's just, it's up to you and what you want to do and what you have time for. And so, um, oh, Mary Jurgens, we had records from Follett and they did come in RDA. Yeah, it probably just depends on what materials you're getting. If something is older, it probably will be an AACR2. If something is newer, I would hope it'd be an RDA. And it may depend on Follett and where they're getting their records from, if they're cataloging things in-house or if they're pulling them from OCLC. Um, and like I said, not every, I think I said this last week, uh, not every library is cataloging an RDA. Yes, there are libraries that I, are still cataloging AACR2 and uh, are bringing in um, AACR2 records. Uh, you know, I'm still dealing with a mishmash. Seems like hybrids, I think. They have the RDA carrier fields, but I've noticed they still use a lot of abbreviations from AACR2, and that's from Alyssa. And yes, you, we will see a lot of hybrid records for a, a really long time, uh, where they have gone in and added the, the, the RDA carrier fields, the 336, 337, and 338, but they haven't made any other changes. Uh, they haven't added the 264, or they still have um, the abbreviations. And I think, and I don't know what OCLC's plan is, if they plan to go in and RDA eyes everything at some point, I don't know. I know when I was in Montana, our consortium chose to bring in a vendor who would RDA eyes all our records. That is, go in and add those 33X and swap the 264 for the two, or the 260 for the 264, 
and you know, get rid of the abbreviations and update some of those subject headings um, that were affected by the RDA rule change as well. And I know this this class, this session has become, uh, I think, more about RDA than MARC, and that's okay. I'm Like I said, I'm always happy to answer whatever questions you have. Um, RDA and MARC are related. They do play together. Not always well, uh, but they do play together. <laughs> and a lot of what, um, you know, MARC is affected by RDA, and we have seen some changes. Um, in, in MARC, and we'll probably continue to see more changes as RDA grows and evolves. And then, you know, at some point, um, MARC will be replaced by another standard. But we're really not going to get into that because they're still figuring that out. And it's very theoretical at this point, And it makes my head hurt just to think about it. So... So we've got about 15 minutes left. And I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, if not, that's okay. We can go ahead and go. Um, I'll sit here for a few more minutes in, in case someone is typing away. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Allison. I'm assuming that means you're not confused. Thank you, Arlene. Have a great day, too. And if you guys have questions about the homework, you know, feel free to email me and I'll answer them. Um, and we can talk about that, you know, next week, too, if going through you had some questions or you're confused. So I think um, that there doesn't seem to be any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead. Oh, OK. I do have a question here, it looks like. Let me go back there. In your handout on page six, the 245 field has a first indicator as zero, but there is an author. Oh, that's probably a typo. Um, thank you for pointing that out, Mary. That's that's actually something I, when I'm cataloging, I um, I don't always catch myself. So I will go ahead and make sure that's changed for the next time I do this class. And okay, Rachel is feeling pretty good about things so far. Okay, well, good. That's good to know. Um, I will go ahead and get this posted to YouTube and get that link up on our class website. So if you need to go back and view the video, you can. And I will, um, if I need to, I will go ahead and transcribe the questions and, and comments and get those posted as well. So thank you for coming today. And um, we'll talk again next week. And let me go ahead and stop.